Today on The Topic Show, Kyle Rittenhouse is sued by his attacker for emotional damage, Bernie Sanders wants to tax robots, and NPR is going to be cutting their staff by 10%. All of that and much, much more on The Topping Show. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Today's episode of The Topping Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN and Topping Technologies. ExpressVPN helps protect your online data, and Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. If you're an IT leader or a business owner who needs assistance with your tech, you reach them at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Jumping into the business part of the podcast, Tesla announced they're going to be building a new headquarters in California. However, it's a little bit of a deceiving news line. If you read the actual articles that you're seeing, you'll notice that it's a engineering HQ. So it's not their legal headquarters. That's still in Austin, Texas. And Elon made a very, Elon notes right now that they're going through a quote unquote poetic transition, which might, might be a nice way of saying they're trying to increase their engineering recruitment in California. When COVID first hit, Elon and a lot of other companies based in California were hit with the threat and then subsequent actual action of being shut down by the government. No matter how careful Elon wanted to plan the safety for his employees and execute his ideals for how to do based safely provide for them, the government came in and forced them to shut down. And that was the final straw for Elon. And someone actually, there's a leaked test, text message by a California political figure. And they literally told Elon to F off. And that was the final straw where he left the state and left. It's estimated that they've saved a couple bil- a couple billion dollars just moving the legal headquarters to Austin, Texas. It's a very big, important thing to note that that's the last California company that left in terms of automotive. If you go back in time, Honda used to have their North American headquarters in California. And famously, Toyota, that was North American headquarters for years. And they famously moved to Plano, Texas a few years back and built a huge, beautiful North America headquarters campus, even has a museum in there. And they're saving, of course, billions of dollars as well. So you're seeing a trend of a lot of these companies leaving. And it's ironic that a lot of people see Tesla as one of the EV leaders and one of the greenest companies where they argue is better for the environment because you're using batteries and you don't have to depend on fossil fuels for the energy unless you charge it with the coal plant, depending on where you live. It's either better or worse on the environment. You have to check your local electric provider. There's a lot more variables than people like to admit, like many things in life. However, that company was ousted from California. So it's interesting to see. They seem to be warming up to the governor of at least Gavin Newsom in California. And this is not their headquarters. It is a engineering headquarters. So it'll be a new area for them to do more R&D. I'm honestly not sure why they're increasing that investment. It just might be the talent pool in Silicon Valley in California is so great which, because they do have such a large volume of engineering resources in that in that area. But they still have a huge presence and, of course, their global headquarters in Austin. Now, interestingly enough, NPR, or National Public Radio, is going to cut 10% of its staff in order to make up for a $30 million gap in its budget. It's going to equal to about 1,100 employees being let go. And the notes that they say as to why they're letting them go is a decrease in ad revenue and corporate sponsorships. And a lot of people know it's a very political-leaning news outlet. It's certainly not conservative by any means. You'd be hard-pressed to find one person politically even a little bit to the right on that news outlet. Not Not a lot of diversity in that regard. And it's also federally funded. So I looked into some of the data for a little bit to see where does their money come from. And technically speaking, they directly get 1% of their, a little less than 1% of their funds from the federal government, which more granularly is like about 6%. However, I looked into a website called GigaFax, G-I-G-A Fax, or GigaFact Notes. And this is an interesting breakdown. So the government support for the public radio and TV comes from an entity called the Corporation for Bu- Public Broadcasting, also known as CPB. 
Now, CPB grants $114 million every year to 1,178 local radio stations. And NPR relies on the local radio stations for about 34% of its budget, with many affiliates being in small rural areas and other parts in the United States. Now, that's interesting how they indirectly get a lot of their funding from that. And I see the intention behind it. However, I don't see how it's the government's job to prop those up. And the decrease in corporate sponsorships, and that's not too surprising. And it's one of those things where, much like book publishing, majority of all media does not make money. It loses money. The only way you could possibly pay for it to even break even or even make a profit is corporate sponsorships and individual contributions. That's why every sponsor, every podcast has a sponsor. My company, my other company offsets the cost of me having to do this. And I don't think that's the government's job to give away tax debtors, taxpayer dollars for those instances. There's a lot of local mom and pop shops who could help sponsor those local radio companies who I think they would get a lot of good advertising dollars out of that. I don't see how it's the government's job to do that, no matter the intentions. I think they should be coming from local businesses and the community to provide those types of news sources. Now, going to a little bit of the criticism of the NPR, a lot of people criticize them for using taxpayer funds for lobbying for government benefits. Specifically, in 2020, they spent $639,000 targeting the House and Senate representatives and versions of local news with a emergency information act which would extend the PPE payment for the payment protection plan for media outlets that benefit NPR. So it's a fascinating way to invest over a little bit over half a million dollars but they're asking for more monies via the PPE program. Now they also did in 2011 they were criticized for lobbying against Republicans who are typically, well, they claim, how many of them actually act, much fewer, like many politicians, but they claim to want to decrease funding from similar programs, such as PBS, as well as NPR, which they shouldn't, if they truly are really independent, and they're getting less than 1% of their budget from the federal government directly, and the rest are affiliates, where some of like, think of it somewhat as a franchisee, so to say, rudimentarily speaking, I don't know why they have such uh why they be such up in arms and feel threatened by that. Now other criticism came in 2020 where they donated to political political candidates. They donated about thirteen thousand dollars, of which ninety ninety-two, so ninety-two percent of that funding was going to Democratic Democrats running for office. And if you look into the actual material, they're pretty politically biased. I prefer to try I try to absorb news both on the left and the right in the middle so I can kind of gain a little perspective and see. It's always good to know what the other side is thinking, what other folks are thinking, and gain a better overall perspective and form a more less biased opinion, more educated opinion, because you are able to evaluate both sides of the argument. So I, it's unfortunate that they're having to decrease the size of it, but that's by no means. Every media company is going through this. CNN famously, a couple months back, they launched their CNN Plus program, which, which was many speculated was going to crash and burn from the beginning, but that was their subscription program. Within months, it failed, and they're laying off a lot of their top talent. I say in quotes because subjectively, I don't know how many of them have talent. I won't go into the names, but a lot of those companies are bleeding money, especially now when every business is cutting their advertising dollars. Because a lot of those things, the hardest thing about media is how do you directly quantify the actual ROI or return investment, which I still can't believe car companies advertise with commercials on TV because it is hard to quantify. If you, someone goes to buy a car, how do you, unless they check a box that says, I bought this car because I saw this advertisement at this time at this date. It's very hard to actually direct correlate. With my podcast, thankfully, some of them result in direct projects. So it's a little, it's much easier. I'm just a smaller company, but it's easier to point and actually quantify the ROI, but a lot of companies struggle with that. And it's no surprise that NPR is struggling as well. Now, Amazon is going to get Amazon continues to grow. They're going to acquire one medical for $3.9 billion. This would give them the ability to provide primary care to more than 200 brick and mortar doctor offices and access to their 815,000 patients. 
Interestingly enough, the Federal Trade Commission, or the FTC, said that they would not challenge the sale, though regulators are still examining the potential for consumer harm and lack of competition. One Medical would also allow for Amazon to expand its Telnet medical services. And given the total market of over 400,000 United States American citizens, or about, I think it was about our population size, roughly speaking, it's going to be hard to make any argument that you're making a dent currently in the healthcare market with this acquisition of having less than 1 million patients in it. So currently there's, I don't, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think that's going to be a very strong or valid argument. Long-term, it does appear Amazon is continuing to expand into that, but it'll be see if it's actually challenged. There's only been, the FTC's only struck down one or two major acquisitions or mergers in the past 10 years. It'll be interesting to see if they start to ramp that up or how they continue to sway back and forth on those decisions. Now, Stellant surprisingly enough, in the automotive, Stellantis posted a record annual, annual profit. And a lot of people might not know or might not have ever heard of Stellantis. It's kind of a new rebranded name. It's a Dutch headquarter company, and it's the parent company, automotive company, behind all of these brands, including Fiat, Maserati, Dodge, Jeep, Chrysler, Alfa Romeo, Citroën, DS Automobiles, Opel, Peugeot, and Vauxhall. So that's quite a few brands with many of them being much more popular overseas with Fiat famously purchasing Chrysler Group, which Chrysler owned Dodge, uh, Dodge and Jeep during the 2008 when the Chrysler company went bankrupt. Another fun automotive fact, the only successful startup, quote unquote, in terms of American automotive companies since Chrysler was Tesla, which is a huge testament to that company because so literally, literally everyone else has failed, which is a fascinating, fun build business fact. Now, going back to Stellantis, they announced a 4.2 billion euro dividend for shareholders, equating, equating, equaling, sorry, to about 1.34 euros per share. And the board approved a share buyback of 1.5 billion euro by the end of 2023. And with stock buybacks, allow the shareholders to find it advantageous because it increases the price of the stock and also makes the company a little bit more efficient depending on how it work, works overseas. But in the United States, a lot of certain decisions have to be voted by the shareholders, less people voting, less cost, less complexity. So there are a couple of benefits to businesses doing that, which is why you hear a lot of companies doing stock buybacks is a very popular way to reinvest in your own company. Now, going into some of the technical interest, interests of Slantis, they actually revamped their engine platform in 2022 with a turbo straight six cylinder engine, which is inline, inline six, and it is a internal combustion engine or ice engine. And they use that for a lot of their platforms. And I think they're start, one of the reasons they're starting to see that profits go up is because you got that new product up and running you're putting that in a lot of your vehicles and you start to now see the roi on that the ceo said they were going to continue to expand into electric vehicles they sold about 288 evs in europe last year and they're continue they're dedicated to expanding that with dodge famously saying that they're going to make the charger the challenger electric and if you can't if you can't uh if you're not watching if you're just listening to this on stitcher or one of the podcast platforms I cringed for a minute because that reminded me that Dodge actually said they're going to have exhaust noises booming from speakers to make the Charger and Challenger sound like their muscle cars, which is an automotive disgusting thing to do. I, other internal combustion engine company or, um, platforms have done that with boosting sounds through the speakers or artificially increasing some of the exhaust notes or the engine. It's but. Putting it for EV is just beyond bizarre. I mean, it's just, I would, I can't fathom how many people actually want that from their challenger or their charger. Now, last of the business news, at least now kind of going into the politics, the DOJ is pushing ahead with a Google Maps antitrust probe. And it's one of the most important things Google ever did in their history was Google Maps. It was I suspect they, they as a big loss leader for a few years, but that's that's the backbone of so so much of their business. If you think of 
having to look for a doctor or a certain shoe store or a bike store, or what have you, Google Maps makes it invaluable. And they have all that data. And if you ever notice when you open your phone, you look at the Google Maps apps, depending on what time of day you check or what day of the week you check, you'll actually see the name of a particular business and even their logo when you're on there. And that's by no means a coincidence. That's that's how Google makes a lot of their money is the advertisements and selling your data. And it's fascinating to see how that one laying down that track of the Google Maps was able to help them jump accelerate all parts of the business. And the DOJ has been meeting with Google Google competitors and clients lately, perhaps all three of them. I mean, there are, there's not many competitors, realistic competitors to Google Maps. The biggest competitor in my lifetime, or perhaps maybe the past 10 years, was Waze, W-A-Z-E, which was a phone app that was like Google Apps, but a lot of people appreciated the ability to customize a map by giving feedback in real time. So you, if you saw there's an obstruction of the road, you just click a button, you would put a marker on the map, and then everyone would see around you. And you could even specify, I think, I mean, I think there are a couple of variables like, you know, maybe there's a couch on there or an animal or a broken down vehicle. And of course, m most important, importantly for many folks was the speed trap drop. So if you saw a speed trap, you press that button, and then everyone around you would see there's a speed trap at that location. That in and of itself made a multi-million dollar idea, in my opinion. A lot, of, a lot of there's a lot of money in sick tickets that people are trying to save these days. Now, another interesting thing about the antitrust issues, unlike when there are merger reviews, when the government is saying if two companies are, for example, too big to merge into one, which would result in a monopoly, and antitrust issues are not subject to a time constraint, so no one really has any idea how long it should or could take, perhaps because there's no limit that has to, says it has to be done by a certain date. I mean, they could drag it out for years. It'll be interesting to see what the, what the result is. However, there's, there's just so few Google competitors, and they have a monopoly, not necessarily because they're crushing them, but they've built the best. And they've invested countless dollars into making it the best. And I suppose you have Apple Maps. That's one competitor, but... I mean, gone are the days of MapQuest. They might, they're, I'm sure they still, set, they still have a website, maybe even an app. But as far as my research, just, you know, looking at the internet and the Brave and the Google searches, I haven't seen too many, too much evidence of malicious acts by Google that might warrant this. So it just to see how that happens. Now, now on to the culture part of the podcast. Kyle Rittenhouse of me is being hit by a lawsuit from his former attacker, Kyle Rittenhouse was famously 17 years old when he went to Kenosha, Wisconsin in an attempt to protect small businesses. It was a moment when there was a lot of riots in the United States, specifically in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Rioters had taken over a protest. The rioters had obviously turned into rioting, violent group of people. And they were destroying both personal as well as business property and causing harm to people as well. Kyle went over there. You could see him in a video. He was actually providing medical aid to people on both sides of the riot. And he was trying to protect a small business, specifically a car dealership. He was 17 years old, carrying a medical kit on his person, as well as an AR-15. When he was confronted, his life was threatened, and he shot three men. They all happened to be lifetime criminals and some of the most vile men in existence. Now, the first person he shot was, or rather one of the men that he shot was Joseph Rosenbaum, who just happened in perhaps an inappropriate part of the podcast. So if you have young folks listening, escort them out of the room. Joseph Rosenbaum was a convicted child predator with accusations of molesting five different boys ages between 9 and 11. Needless to say, he was the most dis one of the most disgusting, vile souls on the planet doing one of those evil acts possible. He went and he attacked Kyle. Kyle shot him in self-defense. And Anthony Huber, Huber was the other person that Kyle shot. Huber was hitting Kyle with a skateboard. Now, Gage, another man who's threatening his life, he drew a gun on Kyle. So, 
Gage, who a criminal is not supposed to have a gun, reportedly, he pulled a gun on Kyle. So Kyle, thankfully, was able to defend his life and stop the threat. He shot Gage in the arm. Now, on video and in court, Gage confirmed he drew a gun first, pointing it at Kyle. In most states, most constituents, pointing a gun at someone is use of force by a deadly weapon. You're threatening their life. That's why a lot of lawyers and a lot of people will tell you, you never want to be put in an opportunity where you have to pull your gun out in public because you're going to be taken to court. Your threat is just pointing it that even if you don't pull the trigger, pointing it at someone is something that no own, none, no own gun owner wants to do. It's something that no one ever wants to be put in that situation. It's a last resort because you know it will change your life. Even if you have the best lawyers and you're in the right, doing that act is going to change your life. Now, thankfully, Kyle was able to save his life and defend himself properly. So he shot Gage in the arm. And Gage, someone say he's two-faced for this. I certainly would. When he went on social media and he went on all these talk shows gain, gaining popularity as the world called Kyle an evil white supremacist when three people he shot were all white. And even politicians were slandering his name when there's no evidence of this being anything to do with race at all between these gentlemen. Which is not a disgusting, polarizing thing in the United States, I don't think. I think I think people have more in common than they like to believe, and politicians use it as a tool to divide a wedge between many Americans. Some of a tangent ADHD thought. Now, the lawsuit from Gage is suing Kyle on the grounds of emotional distress and humiliation and lost enjoyment of his life. Now, the emotional stress and humilia humiliation I would venture to say is a 110% deserved. He lied and threatened someone's life. So he's getting ridiculed online. But yeah, you're an evil person doing evil things. You deserve to be ridiculed and mocked. It's a disgusting thing he did. And he, he told the truth under oath. And then he went about, about and lied to it, saying that Kyle was threatening him. It's, it's beyond disgusting. And as soon as the video evidence came out, everyone with even a rudimentary knowledge of self-defense, stand your ground policies, they knew Kyle was in the right. And a lot of people will judge a man by his actions, and a lot of people also overlook the fact that Kyle was providing medical aid to multiple people during the whole incident, and after he shot, he shot the man in self-defense, Kyle voluntarily went to the police, gave him his gun, handed his possessions over, you know, obviously properly going to police, you know, you're showing that you're not a threat, and you're telling them about the situation. And Kyle turned himself in. And given all that is intent, just in all the facts thrown out, he was proven innocent in criminal, criminal, sorry, <laughs> too much coffee these days, criminal, criminal court? Jeez. 105 hours a week can't be beat. Does start to add up. That's my average work week. I, it's a good challenge, though. Now, one of the most, this is civil court, so the barrier to a burden of proof is much, much lower. One of the most famous cases that I've referred to before is the O.J. Simpson trial, where he allegedly murdered his ex-wife. In the criminal court, he was proven innocent because you have to have a beyond, you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they are guilty. So that barrier of evidence is much, much higher. Civil court, much, much lower. So that's why O.J. Simpson lost that court case, and he's been having to pay millions of dollars to that, to um, to the Golden family. So this is civil court. So there's there is a chance Kyle might have to pay this guy money, which would be disgusting in and of itself, both morally and from what I understand, with my very rudimentary understanding of legal system and legally as well. And begs the question: Who's paying for all this? Because Gage is a criminal with. This is going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars with the lawyer and litigation fees. The goal is to basically, in my opinion, to bankrupt Kyle and drive home the point that you shouldn't be able to defend yourself. The, um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Kyle is now 20 years old. Many say he makes a living now with his public speaking, or rather speaking at private events and fundraisers, as well as, I don't know how much money he makes, but... People say he's a social media influencer. He has certainly a lot more Twitter followers than I. It's also not saying much, but 
it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. It's a it's a low point in our culture where these types of situations are dividing us when it should be uniting based on the evidence that we can all see, both in video as well as the testimonials. He was in the right. Even if you don't agree, and his politics have never really come out as far as I can tell. It's one of those things where it would be nice if people would come together and say, we all know he did what he had to do to stop the threat, protect himself when he had no other choice. And they were beating him and drawing guns on him, hitting him with a skateboard. I, I can't see how someone could say, oh, Gage, you're under emotional distress because people are making fun of you online. It'll be interesting to see how this pays out, but I'm not buying it personally. So, I don't think Kyle is going to lose if I was a betting man. Now, under the politics part of the podcast, Bernie Sanders wants to put a tax on robots. Yes, you heard me correctly. The things that literally make everything in terms of technology, particularly, and he he claims he wants to tax the robots that are replacing workers. And he also claims this will be an incentive for companies to keep human jobs. This is coming from someone who I don't think he has any experience in the private sector, creating jobs, businesses, profits, losses, understanding employees, and all of the variables that go into making a product. And this will have, in my opinion, no effect on the human employment rate. It's one of those things, especially in technology, one of the reasons most of the technology is assembled by robots is precision manufacturing and assembly. Stuff like, for example, this laptop and Apple Watch, all those things, you could take it apart working on it yourself, sure, but it's not labor cost effective. That's why you have machines where you have specialty machines that could screw six screws at once because they have six screwdriver heads on the machine at once. And even you're getting to the point where surgical procedures are being done by machines because machines don't have any shaky hands. And there are actually robotic machines that humans do control where a human will tell it to cut a certain line and it will eliminate all the jiggle from the hand and all the shakes. It's fascinating technology. But if you're talking about replacing on a traditional like assembly, like an assembly line, like an automotive line, all you're going to do in every one of these instances, you're going to increase the price of the product, which the consumer will pay. So even if you, even if the government increases, a ta- let's say a government increases the tax on a robot for a dollar an hour. Okay. The cost of the goods produced is going to increase by that variable. It's going to offset it. And a really good example is automotive companies. Tesla has hundreds of robots, but guess what? There is a private business make designing, engineering, assembling, shipping those robots, and they're also providing maintenance, both in software, hardware maintenance. So there's a lot that goes into it. We had the same argument during the Industrial Revolution or that debate all those years ago, where people thought all the jobs would be gone. They'd be all, all taken away. And really, the jobs just transform and we create, we create new jobs. That's how it's always been. And it's how it always will be. I don't see in our lives ever being like Star Trek where everything or other similar science, I don't know, I might, I might be hurting some Trekkies because I don't have all that vernacular and all that history of that show to quite pat down. Truth be told, I've seen it a couple of times. But there's not going to be a utopia in our lifetime where we just magically get everything for free. It has to come from somewhere. And just putting a tax on these robots isn't going to solve anything. Robots, for the most part, do a lot of jobs that are either prohibited, prohibitively intense in terms of it's done in a harsh environment, such as welding in a factory for cars where it's hundreds of degrees and a robot can do it faster and more precision. There will always be a boutique thing for hand assembled and handcrafted items. But in terms of the things that most Americans and most people touch on a daily basis, most of them is done with the machinery. I mean, for example, even my tumbler. That's done on a huge factory and it's just literally pressed out again and again and again because it's a very repetitive task and a machine can do it darn near perfectly and the cost is very relatively small. It's a huge 
upper investment with those machines, but businesses will always need jobs. It's the same thing with chat GDP and all these other technologies. Some jobs will be automated out of existence, but they're going to create new jobs. So I don't see this doing any... First of all, I don't think the U.S. government or the House of... I don't think Republicans or Democrats or any politicians really have an appetite for this unless they try to use it as a means to an end for free money for everyone. I I don't see it as a realistic solution when so many businesses that rely on robots... No one wants to increase the price of anything these days. I don't find that at all realistic. Now, other political news, Vivek Ramasewe, uh, uh, Ramaswamy, apologize for butchering, he announced that he will officially be running for president. He's a multimillionaire biotech entrepreneur. He, re within the past few years, he wrote a book called Woke Inc., which I did read as a fascinating book discussing the changing in the advertising and mechanisms that used to guide most businesses becoming more politically driven. A lot of companies having their ideals and advertising and their public facing displays of marketing being more politically driven, as opposed to if you wind the clock back 10 years, no one knew what the hell Coca-Cola voted on. Traditionally, most businesses, for example, Coca-Cola, the only reason they would get involved in politics would be if there's an upcoming tax that's gonna go on sugar or more more accurately, high fructose corn syrup. They would hire lobbyists and they would advocate and even maybe put some posters out and advertising dollars around, vote no against this tax on sugar because it will increase their cost of goods sold and it will directly relate to their customer because the cost of the product will go up and no one's happy about that. So that was very logical and it was very pointed, particularly to their core competencies to their businesses. Now you see many businesses using politics as a marketing mechanism. I'm skeptic. I'm skeptic. Skept I'm very skeptic to see how many of these businesses truly believe in these causes, which I find morally repugnant and disgusting. If you have an authentic ideal, I'll respect it. If it's an educated decision, an educated opinion, I'll respect yours, and I would even be interested to learn about it. But I feel a lot of these businesses are using it just as a marketing club to clutch of the enemies or their opponents in their industries to say, hey, we do this. Look how awesome we are. I mean, is it really authentic? Do you really care? Or is it really just a more marketing mechanism to transform into the new era of politics? And again, as time goes on, politics and business are becoming more and more intertwined every day. And I don't know if it's necessarily a good thing. I don't really care or need to know how these companies vote. And it's important to note they're putting a lot of money behind this so it's affecting the customers. It's going to increase the cost. And I don't know. It'll be interesting to see as time goes by to see how effective it is. Now, going on to the business blunder of the day, this comes pseudo from the government. The U.S. Food and Drug Association, also known as the FDA, they say that soy, oat, and almond liquids, I guess they can call themselves milk, which is disgusting because it's not milk. It is, in fact, a nut is nothing like milk or soy or oat. Milk comes from mammary glands, which is in the dictionary. I don't think they've changed that word yet. But they argue that the consumer is educated enough to know it's not real milk. Then why call it that? They should call it soy juice or oat juice or almond juice or almond liquid. It's not milk. It's the weirdest thing in my generation and it's becoming more and more popular for some reason my most hilarious argument that i find is people say that almonds are great because you know dairy is bad they say or some say because it uses so much resources i mean the cows are polluting the earth and they eat all the grass and they drink a lot of water now almonds are one of the worst things for the environment in terms of water consumption Especially bad because it's always in many of them are grown in California, which always has a water crisis because of prop, many would argue poor water management. Now, it takes 1.1 gallons to make one almond. One. And depending on the websites, I looked at a couple of them and you get varying numbers, but they argue that it takes between 33 and 248 gallons of water to make 
half a gallon of almond milk. Now, personally, I don't think I don't drink any of this stuff, but that's one of the most inefficient things on the planet in terms of input to output. So it's certainly not better for the environment in terms of water cons all that water input needed to make the product, especially if it's in an area of the United States that is desperate for water. So it's almost a triple negative, which I know two negatives cancel each other out. But a uh, mathematician, that'll be math will be for another day. But it's one of the most bizarre things. I don't know why these companies are calling themselves almond milk. I feel like they could a lot of it's just like the fake burger or the impossible burger or impossible meat. If you try to copy something, it's not gonna be as good as the original. People aren't gonna like it. Name something new. Create a new category or a new almond slurry. Think of something different. That way people won't be utterly disappointed when they take a sip and it tastes nothing like milk and more like a foreign substance meant almost like you described milk to someone who's never heard or seen it. It's one of the most bizarre things. Needless to say, that is by far the business blunder of the day. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you'd like to see more content like this, don't forget to like, subscribe. Now go ahead, tell your family, tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell anyone, just, heck, just stay safe, fight the good fight.